So Ted, another company uh, for us to, uh, to look at and a really interesting one uh, today. So for all those in the UK, you will probably have heard of this company. I think it was June, around June last year. Um, and in the US, uh, you may or may not have heard this business anywhere around the world, but let me give you an introduction. So it's a company called Gymshark, and it's become really famous, Ted, actually, because a number of celebrities, including the Kardashians, have been promoting this particular brand. So the founder has been very clever in how he has um, got the word out about the brand through social media. And Gymshark essentially do fitness wear. And they, they became famous in the UK last year because he got an investment group uh, called, let's check the General Atlantic, and I'll talk, talk about them later on, but General Atlantic invested around 200 million pounds, which valued this business at 1 billion pounds, which officially made it a unicorn business. And it's one of the few in the UK. And the, the founder is very young, 20, I think it was 27 at the time, he's now 28. And uh, I think it's worth looking at the finances for this company because it became such a massive news um, all through the normal news outlets, through social media, it became a big success story. And, and for, for sportswear, no less, it's not technology or the usual suspects when it comes to becoming unicorn businesses. This is very much a, 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 a textile business in, in uh, fitness brands and nothing more than that. Uh, which makes it very interesting. When I dug a bit further, they do, they're doing some really interesting things. But I'd love for us to talk about the finances and see you know, what made it such a high valuation and, uh, and do the finances justify it? Well, it's good to speak to you, Amoe. Thank you very much for once again inviting me on the call. Um, so yeah, I, you know what, I mean, I, I actually do, I do quite a lot of exercise, you know, I'm getting on in my ear, years, but you know, I do a lot of running, I row, uh, kite surfing, uh, skiing, et cetera, et cetera. Oh. I, I'm not really that familiar with the brand either, but I kind of feel it's not really aimed at me. It's very much the younger generation. It's the Instagram market. If you're going to go to the gym and work out and take pictures of you kind of ripping your biceps or doing whatever <laughs> it is you're doing and posing, you kind of want to look good. And, uh, and, you know, my understanding is that, you know, he just felt that there was nobody who really had the right brand out there or the right clothing. And therefore that's what he's tried to, to, to fill. And as yeah. you say, He's been very successful at it, and it's a really interesting route to market. So, uh, Jim Shark. So, the first thing to realize about the numbers that we're going to look at, Moeed, is that these numbers. Um, so, it, it's a fairly simply simple setup for a company. Um, it's not actually they've set up a new company called I think it's called Clyde. Um, which is the holding company. So yeah. we're going to look at Gymshark, but you can go one up, but the holding company is a non-trading company. So the numbers in the holding company are pretty much the same as the financial statements. And I'll just come on to a couple of reasons why I think that there's this, this uh, difference, this holding company. So as we know, the, uh, the holding company, uh, so the uh, Gymshark, they make uh, 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 gym wear. So that's you know what they're, they're talking about here um, and the way that they have uh, expanded. Um, so let's just jump straight in and look at, and, and here's our, here's uh, Mr. Um, uh, ben Francis, I think his name is, yeah. um, who's uh, obviously doing extremely well for himself um, and congratulations to him. Uh, so no problems with the audit report. Uh, the, uh, the auditors uh, appear pretty happy um, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the um, uh, uh, numbers. So here we see uh, the turnover. So this is, uh, we're looking at the income statement here um, uh, to look at the, 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 the trading account. The first thing to notice is that the gross margin of this company, that's the, the 117.5 million pounds worth of profit. Let me get my annotation um, uh, uh, chart out. So that's this number here expressed as a percentage of sales is about 67%. Uh, yeah, so 67 percent it's very very high indeed yeah. now um it, it is very very high and the reason it's high i think is because of their model uh, and what you've got to look at is this number here as yeah. well so if you're nike for example nike their distribution methodology is through is through shops basically so um you know, and the shops is kind of a cost of sale. 
Um, whereas here, it's it's basically it's all it's all the kind of the, the postage. So there's a lot of postage going on there. It should appear as part of the um the sales general and administrative. You know, so the cost of sales is only um uh, the cost of actually you know the product that they're selling. Um, uh, and the manufacture of that product, but so it won't include uh, the the end distribution cost. But there is an argument that actually, for analysis purposes, we should probably putting uh, that figure and including it up there. Um, uh, and we're going to then come into something which is a little bit closer to the industry average. And the industry average is the rule of thumb is basically you make about a a forty forty to fifty percent gross margin on your products. Um, so remember that. Uh, Moeed, next time you go into uh, the local sportswear shop and you see that it's seven, it's a 30% discount, they're still making money. Okay, this is a reasonably high margin gain um, that they work in. Um, the other thing to notice is here is that, you know, this, this is a massive growth success. So that they are growing rapidly. Um, in fact, if you just take these two numbers here, so that's about a 76 million uh, or 73 million increase on a base of 100 million in 2018, that's about a 70% increase, okay? Yes. That's massive, so 70%. So this is the real kind of success story. They're not managing to translate it into the bottom line. So the growth at the top line is not reflected in the growth at the bottom line, mm. okay? So uh, part of the reason is that their gross profit margin is falling, only slightly, it's down from 72 to 67%. Um, and the operating costs have gone up significantly. So look at this increase in the admin expenses, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, again, we don't know exactly why that is. So traditionally in our analysis, admin costs are what we call fixed costs and suggest that as you grow your business, you don't need any more uh, administration costs because you only need one website, for example, you only need one head office, uh, rent stays the same. Um, what we may see here is that this is big investment though. This is obviously a rapidly growing company and therefore they are heavily investing. They're expanding overseas. They're setting up overseas operations, yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera. So you yeah. may find that the administrative cost is a kind of an investment in the future, if that makes sense, like yeah. buying a new head office. Okay. Well, they're making a big push. So it's just worth bearing that in mind. Yeah, I mean, they're making Go a on. big push into the USA. So they've just set up an office there. Can't remember where it is. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but you don't need to spend 20 million setting up no, an office no, in the USA. No, no. I mean, it, it's, you know, there's, there's a big, there's a big, big number going on there. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, I mean, I think last time we spoke, um, we were talking about Kazoom and I was kind of likening it to the, the space shuttle where they're trying to, they're spending a lot of money and they're burning cash very, very quickly in order to accelerate and get momentum. These guys, uh, they're equity funded. Uh, uh, they've uh, reinvested all of their profits. Um, they, you know, he's he's done the perfect growth. He owns, uh, you know, he's owned pretty much the whole company all the way through. He still owns uh, seventy percent of it. You know, it's it's been a real success story. He's he's used the cash he's generated from the sale yesterday to invest in generating the sale tomorrow. So it's 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 a really really good story here. Um, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna de detract from it. And 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 there's a obviously a big uh, accelerating investment, but they're doing it and they can afford it, which is really really good. So it's a nice it's a it's a strong P and L. Um, it's a it's a it, you know it's 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 a good company um they're making lots and lots of profits and those profits are all being reinvested you look down here they're just not paying out any dividends at all all yeah. of the profits they make are being reinvested back into the business right so that's the first thing we kind of we, we kind of see very profitable company uh net margin nine percent down from 14 percent uh, in the previous year um the profit is growing it's not growing massively lots of in investment going on top line very very you know 70 percent growth um uh, very exciting and actually if we project that along i think the estimate for sales 260 million they're talking about for 2020 obviously they haven't filed their accounts yet if they run at the same sort of margins we should be expecting profits in the region of about 20 million but again that assumes that the admin costs are going up as well so whether they can start to leverage their fixed costs will be a big key to really nailing that bottom line right and, and something to remember is that they don't market themselves as a premium brand. 
So the prices are not going to be as high as I think Nike, Nike and, and, and those. So um, they don't market themselves as premium, but they do market themselves as affordable, but great, great quality, great look, et cetera. Absolutely, yeah. Like and, and it, yeah, and, and it's, uh, yeah, and so, and so they've got a very, very big market out there. They're very much for, for the mass market mm. um, and lots of people buying into it. And, and that's an interesting kind of, that's an interesting approach. You know, you think about the brands in the marketplace, you know, if everybody else is wearing the same brand as me, does it lose its value? Um, in my personal experience, I've been, I've seen a lot of people wearing Canada Goose uh, recently. I don't know, maybe it's just me here in Southwest London, but I'm kind of thinking everybody's got a, everybody's got Canada Goose. It, it's, it's kind of lost that exclusivity to me. I mean, I know it's a very different um, uh, a position of a brand, but, uh, and I'm not a brand expert, by the way, Moeen. I'm a, I'm a financial expert, not a brand. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I'm really interested to see what you have to say about, uh, unless unless you have more to say about the PL, but I'm really interested to see what you have to say about the balance sheet because you're right in saying that their model is, is you know, they, they they call themselves direct to consumer, and and it, you know this they've really capitalised on I think a trend that's only going to grow, especially with the pandemic. Uh, I used to work with uh, Bayerstorf, who are a German company that uh, they're the makers of the brand Nivea. And uh, four years ago, I think it was, I think it was about four years ago, maybe five years ago, they were starting to kind of dip their toe into the direct to consumer model. They saw that this was an area that was going to grow. They can command more margin. They can have more direct relationship with the consumers rather than through the retail stores. And I think Gymshark have really capitalized it and showed that, you know what, this model can really work for you. So I'm interested to see what you have to say about the balance sheet and how that probably compares to companies like Nike where a large part of what they do is still through the retail and in fact, their own stores as well. Absolutely. So, um, well, first of all, uh, and I haven't looked at Nike's balance sheet, so you caught me on the hop as, oh, as a comparison there. That's I'm okay. More about, more um, of a, uh, an industry thing. But, but, yeah. it's, but it's thinking about, so Nike, but Nike probably, and I'm guessing here, Nike probably won't own their stores, they'll rent their stores. And therefore yeah. the stores will appear a little bit like the distribution costs rather than having distribution costs oh, yeah, which is Gymshark they'll have store rental and, and the operating costs and the, all the salaries um, uh, 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 sitting in the P&L so the stores won't sit in the balance sheet unless they physically own them as oh, I said yeah. it's not really what they what they do but I've put up in front of you um, so here is the um, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the balance sheet um, uh, we can start to see. So let's just highlight a few things. So uh, these are the fixed assets of the business. So what they need to run the business. So this will be tables and chairs, plant machinery, equipment. Not a very big number there. It's ten million pounds. Um, you don't need a lot of money to, to run this. You know, you can you can rent your warehouses. They can have some computer systems and some some distribution and IT and uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You can see that they've got some intangible assets, which is probably IT equipment. I'm um, sitting in there. This is really this is a working capital business, and that's really looking at these numbers here. So we can see from these numbers, they've got 22 million quids worth of stock, which is double what they had last year. Kind of makes sense. They're rapidly increasing the business. They want to hold the stock. The last thing they want to be doing is selling stuff, um, which is out of stock. So they've got to be able to meet that stock fulfillment. Mm. They got a little bit of debtors in there, but you're, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you this in a bit more detail later. None of those are trade debtors. They don't run trade debtors. You pay and then we ship. Um, so it's a really healthy uh, um, nice. uh, 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 approach from a cash flow point of view. Um, they've got a decent amount of cash, 21 million last year, up to 30 million this year. So um, lots and lots of cash, very strong, very healthy. And the creditors, that's the people they have to pay soon, only 32 million. So if we compare these two numbers together, they've got lots of cash, lots of liquidity, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about this business falling flat on its face. I'm not worried about it. It's not going to be able to pay its bills. It's a really, really strong business. Right. Um, people talk about there's no debt. It's not strictly true. There is a little bit of debt. It's tucked in this number here. It's about five and a uh, sorry, four and a half million pounds. But relatively speaking, compared with the um, uh, uh, with the size of the business, if we compare the debt to the equity and this number here is the equity, 
we're really saying they don't have a substantial amount of debt that you know there's nothing to write home about so it's absolutely fine the amount of debt they've got and you can see there's a little bit of interest uh, in the income statement we actually almost missed it because it was such a small number compared with the rest they can afford this is a bit like mode you earning a million pounds a year and having ten thousand pounds left on your mortgage you're just not going to lose any sleep over it so you know it's a it's a really 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 strong balance sheet so i, I you know hats off to uh, and actually reading a little bit about ben um you know what he did do very early on he knew he was onto something uh, good he brought in a ceo and a cfo so he's had somebody running the numbers you know, a really good, you know, obviously, a, you know, competent individual running the numbers and then a CEO running the business that allows him to kind of focus on the slightly bigger picture uh, and how he's taking it to market product development, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, and this, I think, is a really key uh, strength of Ben is that he recognizes his own limitations. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've lost count of the number of times I've seen small businesses. They grow, they grow rapidly. Uh, they run out of cash. Uh, the managing director isn't or the owner isn't prepared to let go. They're not prepared to kind of build a competent team around them with the systems and processes in place to allow them to actually control that business. So they, they don't like giving away control. So, you know, absolute hats off to him. You know, he's yeah. he's you know, I mean, he, he is a textbook of how to grow, uh, you know, a startup business from mum's attic um, up to, you know, what is you know clearly a very successful business. Yeah, yeah, really good story. Really good story. Um, uh, one of the things I'll notice, I, I'll mention here, um, Moe, is that there's no cash flow statement. Okay, and yes, the reason is sure. there's no cash flow statement is they don't have to prepare one if you're a subsidiary company. You only have to prepare it at the head office, which is one of the reasons why it's quite interesting to go up one stage uh, and look at the head, uh, at the um, the group accounts. Um, uh, and they basically show that, you know, they're making a profit of about 15 million. They're generating cash of 11.7 million. Now, the cash is a little bit lower than profit, and that's a little bit nervous, um, but it's a very, very strong cash generating business. So I'm not going to lose uh, a lot of sleep over that. But they don't have a business model that is generating more cash than profit, which lots of businesses like Coca-Cola and telcos and supermarkets do, for example. Mm. Okay. And if, it, if it's um, just, just for the benefit of those watching, uh, can you just translate what that probably means in terms of what they're doing in the business? So if the cash is slightly lower than the profit, does that mean that they are using some of that cash for the business and to grow it further? Or is there more to yes. it? Yes, potentially. Well, let me, let's, 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 let, I'm just going to pull in that cash flow statement so that we can, yeah. so we're actually talking about the right sort of numbers. Um, so this is quite, so this is, a, this is a useful, and actually, Moeed, um, you know, when I'm talking to my, to my delegates, to my clients, um, this is probably the least understood part of the business. So this is the wow. bit that people really struggle with. So what we've got on the, on the screen right now is the cash flow. And the top line is the profit. So that's straight out of the profit and loss account. And, and this is their, their profit for their financial year, the bottom line, the net profit. And what they do is that they then make some adjustments for non-cash items. So an example here is depreciation. Depreciation is a cost of the business. Wow. But if your car depreciates in value, you don't lose cash from your bank account. It's an accounting adjustment. OK, and that's what's going on here. They've got these sort of number of different adjustments that they're making. So, for example, they've got some accrued expenses. Um, so these accrued expenses, expenses I've incurred, but I haven't yet paid for. Therefore, they're reflected in the profit and loss account, but the cash hasn't walked out. Mm. The key, I think, is this bit here. This is the movement in working capital. So what we see here, for example, the top line is that they have taken a lot of the cash they're generating and invested it in more stock. Makes sense. They're growing business. If you're going to double in sales, which they practically have, you're going to need a lot more stock. And so they need to be buying that stock. OK, so making sure and I'm sure they've got systems and, uh, you know, and, and the kind of the metrics which are measuring this in a manageable way. What's moving quickly? What isn't moving quickly? What's prof uh, uh, popular? What isn't popular? Uh, you know, the way he, he manages his various kind of, you know, lines and ranges, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
but you know but that's a that's a key thing often you see companies that they grow uh they grow rapidly they invest in you know lots more stock and then they suddenly realize they haven't got enough uh, money to pay their suppliers or to pay their staff for example hmm. so we're going from this number up the top uh, down to this number here and this is the cash generation so they're generating a lot of cash and and you know i, I I'm, I'm not going to fault it you know 11.7 million uh, pounds of cash generation is a fantastic number the the next part of the um cash flow then uh or hang on a second, let me just um, clear that down for us. Um, so the next part of the cash, I'm just going to scroll down a little bit, uh, is effectively what do they do with that cash? So this is the this is basically a cash profit that they're generating. It, it's the cash equivalent of an accounting profit. Hmm. This bit here is the investment. So they're growing, they're a growing business. You'd expect them to be investing. They're mainly investing in tangible assets. So this will be you know, if they're going to buy a, uh, you know, uh, uh, a production site, maybe they're buying warehouses rather than wet renting them, um, uh, buying tables, chairs, computers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and a little bit of intangible assets. So this will be um, some maybe research and development, maybe IT investment. Um, again, we can have a look at it, see if there's uh, any clues on that. Um, and they have raised some, some debt. OK, so there you can see that they've actually financed some of this through debt and mm -hmm. therefore what we're doing is we're taking this number here. Okay, we take this number here, less the investment, plus or minus the effect of borrowing, uh, and that gives us the net cash increase. And, and, and that's effectively ends up with the cash going up by about you know, nine, nine million pounds in the year. So they've got lots of money. They've got even more money. They're generating cash. They're spending it. They're spending it wisely. You know, they're, they're ticking every box on, you know, financially. We, we like this company, Moe. Yeah, yeah, I like it too. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great one. Um, let's, just, let's just bounce into uh, some of the, um, uh, the, the notes. So I'm just going to just run through. So... Um, here we've got our staff costs. Now, I, 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 you may remember last time I asked you to do a little calculation. So you might just do a, a calculation for me again. I have to. I haven't even prepared it myself. But so there's 261 staff, and they're paid 18 million pounds um, in total. So what's the average pay per member of staff? You remember we were looking at Kazoo. And we reckoned that the average staff member was getting about one hundred and twenty seven thousand pounds, which sounded quite high to me. Quite yeah. a generous payroll if I was an investor in that business. And don't forget, they're burning lots of cash. So they are very dependent on investors. These guys are not burning cash. They are not dependent on the investors. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's so much more general, modest than Kazoo. So their average is just over sixty nine thousand pounds. 69,000. And that's going to be skewed. There's going to be some head office who are kind of, you know, paid, you know, a fairly substantial amount. Obviously, this uh, this includes the directors, you'll notice. It includes the directors, um, but it won't include. Um, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, so it'll be skewed by some 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 big payments in there. Yeah. Um, now, you may remember Alex Chesterman um, uh, was uh, earning um, uh, only about 300,000. Um, the director's remuneration. Um, so old Ben is paying himself about two million quid. Yeah. You know what? He's worth it. I, I've got I got no problem with that. So the directors in total are yeah. taking out about four, five point five million pounds. Uh, and uh, I forget exactly how many directors there were. Let's five. just um, Maybe four or five. Four or five. So so that's so so here we go. Here here's a here's a directors. Um, let's just uh, zip through to the directors. Yeah, so five directors, yeah. four directors, one's gone, Chapel's gone. So you've got four directors in there. So that'll be basically his CEO and the CFO um, who are probably splitting um, uh, the, 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 the last two between them. So two, two, million, two million to, um, I would guess something like two million to Ben and a million to um, uh, uh, each to the other, other three. And then if you take those out of the, um, the staff numbers, Let's yeah. just go back to our staff numbers. Where were they? Um, yeah, yeah, so if you take 18 and you deduct the five, you're left with about 13 million. 13 yeah. million between 261 is, you're probably looking at about 50,000 or something. Yeah, 49. Yeah, 49, almost 50, yeah. Yeah, 49, yeah, 50,000. So, and, and that, 
and that sounds a you know that sounds a pretty reasonable. So you know, mm-hmm. and if, if there are any employees here, I'm sure they'll they'll say whether they feel that aggrieved as they're being underpaid to ship stuff around there. But you know, this is the capitalist business. You know, and and you know, um, uh, so staff cost looks looks pretty reasonable to me. Um, very little interest. They're paying tax really like this. They're paying tax. You know, they're you know they're paying more tax than Starbucks have paid practically yeah. ever here in the UK. So there doesn't you know they're they're not damaging their reputation through offshore shell companies and sticking stuff in Luxembourg and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, big, big tick there. Um, There's the intangible assets we talked about. So it is, it's IT and software. So they're investing in their distribution platform, in their their social uh, media platforms, whatever they're using. Um, They've got the, uh, uh, so land and buildings, they're buying land and buildings, plant and machinery. I can't think that they need a lot of, you know, I I don't know that, that they're manufacturing um, uh, you know, to what extent they're outsourcing their manufacturing, whether it's done in the UK, whether it's overseas, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of get impression it's got to be a bit overseas given the margins that they're working towards. Um, they've got an investment in another company that's pretty irrelevant, I think, at the moment. Um, so they've got, so this kind of just says that they, you know, they're, they're investing in overseas subsidiaries. They're looking to grow. You mentioned USA. We've got Hong Kong sitting there. And then we come into the last section. Uh, sorry, the, the next section here, which is the um, the working capital. Before I do that, any any questions on the top half of the balance sheet, the in, the investment capital? No, I don't know. I think you've covered everything there pretty pretty well. So no, no questions. Um, so let's look at the working capital, which is basically what you're looking at now. Um, so there's the cash, and then you've got stocks. People who owe us money, and people we owe money to. So mm. stock, as we mentioned, is pretty high. Um, in fact, their stock turnover is quite high. Um, mm. I did a little calculation and I reckon that they hold stock for just over 100 days. It's about 108 days uh, on average. Mm. Um, I don't have a sort of historical figure, but you know, that's quite a long time to have money tied up. And, and there's a sort of, so I reckon that they're watching that quite closely. They're making sure that they're not holding stock for too long. It becomes obsolete, gets damaged maybe. Um, it costs you to store it. And also it may be, it goes out of fashion. I don't know they're, they're, they're kind of how, how often they're bringing in new fashions. So that's an important point. Uh, you'll anyone, notice anyone watching this who's involved in uh, logistical warehouse solutions or anything like that, that, that's an important number to look at. Anything that you can do to help reduce that, they're going to like it. Absolutely. And yeah. sales and marketing. Yeah. And, uh, and if they want to know how I calculated that number, they've got to get in touch with me. Yeah, of course. They um, do. <laughs> you'll see trade debtors. I've, I've, highlight, I've highlighted the trade debtors. No trade debtors at all. Everything, you know, you pay and then, you, and then it gets shipped nice. to you. Um, not sure what's in the other debtors. Um, and then down here, trade creditors. So you can see this yeah. is the, these are the suppliers, the people they're buying the kit from. And I reckon by my calculation that their um, trade debtor days um, are, let me just work out, uh, here we go, 51 days. So I reckon that they're paying 51 days on average, which is, you know, there's an EU director says, I mean, you know, they're obviously a big company. They're very successful. They've got the negotiation clout. You know, traditionally we do 30 days here in the UK. Um, uh, they're pushing it up towards 60. That's just good, good, uh, good cash management. So well done for that. So expect that if you're trying to sell to them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this number here, accruals and, and, and deferred income. So these numbers here, this is deferred income. This is income I've received, but not yet actually earned. So what you may find here is that this is this is uh, people who've paid for things and we haven't yet shipped it or it's out of stock and we need to fulfill that order. So um, I don't think that's a, that's a major issue, but it's just one to kind of keep an eye on because they're going to have to either give the money back or make sure they can fulfill those orders. It could be the sign of a, of a very strong order book. Yeah, significant it's, number though, 14 million. It is, it is, it is a significant number. It's not something you'd expect, but it may be, you know, if you think about it, 176 million. Uh, so as it, what's that about 10%, um, yeah. it may be that it just, you know, obviously if you buy something from them, you know, you put your credit card details in and make the purchase, they've then got to go through the order fulfillment. And I don't know their lead time, but maybe it takes them two or three days to get it out into the, into the post uh, and off. 
to you, for example. Yeah. You know, and when you take ownership, that's when they recognize. So again, you're back into you know, when do they recognize the sale? Is it when yeah. they ship it? Is it when you um, actually, you know, when it's delivered to you, for example? It's probably when it's delivered because that's when you take ownership. Yeah. Um, so some interesting numbers in there. Um, we just uh, scroll down a little bit further. So there you can see the debt. Um, so they've got the bank loans, 4.7 million still sitting on the, um, uh, and there's a little bit of a bank loan up here. So you add those, uh, those two numbers together and you get the total bank loan. So there's a little bit of debt, but really, you know, nothing to, nothing to write home about, nothing to, 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 to worry about too much. Um, and, and really, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's, it's, you know, as I said, that, that you know, it's owned by the, um, the Clade Group. I don't know where they got the, the name Clade from, but um, uh, the, the bank loan um, uh, is, is, is fixed on, is, is, a, is a fixed bank loan. Um, they've got a few, a, a little bit of uh, finance leases, you know, that's, you know, their, their cars perhaps are on a lease or the, the photocopier. Um, that's it. I mean, it's just, you know, there's, there's not a lot else. I mean, they talk a little bit about financial instruments here. This is kind of, you know, as they start to become international, they're going to need to kind of, you know, manage their currency and currency fluctuations. Yeah. But a lot of them, they say, you know, they're, they're incurring costs and earning revenue in similar currencies. So they're kind of, you know, they're not really doing a huge amount of hedging um, uh, 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 on, that, on that point. Um, and then here are the under shares. So they've got A and B shares. I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure exactly. You may find that Ben owns the A shares and that he's given the B shares to somebody else. It may be voting rights. Um, I don't know. And uh, a bit of capital commitment. So they committed to spend 1.5, 1.6 million pounds on, on equipment next year, for example. Obviously, that would have been this year, 2020, because these are 2019 numbers. And, 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 that's, and that's really it. I mean, there's, you know, there's 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 nothing else that you know we can we can say about that you know it's mr mr b francis i take my hat off to him he's achieved the dream and and he's done it and he's done it really really well i think this will be a really interesting case study and if there are any small business owners or entrepreneurs out there you know this is a this is a good example of how to run a business and not you know he's not running before he can walk he's you know he's done it very methodically he's reinvested cash he hasn't taken too much out of the business uh and he's now sitting pretty on a you know on a fantastic business yeah and and, and you know what? It, it's so interesting to look at the finances of a business because i'm starting to really appreciate this because most people's eyes glaze over when they see the finance and they just see numbers and complexity and you know i can't understand that but what I really love about this is you're now, you know, if you look at, if you start to get, compare this to Kazoo that we looked at last time, right? You actually almost get a sense of the character of the company. Yes, the people behind it are the ones who are generating or creating that character of the business. But the finances really tell almost a personality, they give, you an, give you an insight into the personality of the company because Kazoo is just all about, they've got to pump in a lot of money to get that rocket ship to kind of leave the atmosphere. And, you know, they're trying to push out as many cars as possible. They're spending a significant amount, something like just over 4 million on marketing, just marketing alone. You know, they're trying to really get the word out there. Whereas the characters, characteristics and the sense of that I get from Gymshark is slow and steady, right? Be, be not frugal, be smart with the money, slow and steady we're, as you said we're not running before we can walk we're doing this properly but also we're not hesitant either you know we are a growing business we are pushing but we're doing it in a steady and sustainable way that is good for the people that are the stakeholders the customers the suppliers and especially the owners as well that's the kind of sense that i get of the characteristic of this company versus kazoo do you get that kind of sense as well Absolutely, hundred percent. I think that you know Alex Chesterman is somebody who's kind of he's obviously a big personality, uh, and he's really you know he's he's got a great sales pitch, and he sold the story to a bunch of investors, lit the touch paper, and now he's got to make it work. And yeah. I think that Ben, you know, clearly doesn't need to convince anybody. I, you know, I'm not sure that this is slow, um, but it's it's sensible. It's sensible. Yeah, it's sensible. He he hasn't overstretched himself. He 
He hasn't said, oh, I've got a great thing here. Let's go billion dollar global by, you know, by tea time tomorrow, for example. Yeah. So and again, I think that part of that is that, you know, you know, I, I think you've got to be a pretty driven individual to get there and a pretty sassy uh, uh, and savvy individual. But he's also he's built a team around him and yeah. the team are, are really, really strong. And um, it, it's interesting you say talking about the character. It started to get me think. Um, of a of a a company I, I actually once worked for. Um, if you ever um, go into uh, Robert Dias and, and you see the little TVs advertising something that says "Take yours to the checkout now," yeah. um, it's all John Mills uh, and John Mills JML Limited is uh, is an amazing company. And I mean that was that was that's you know million pounds profit this year and a million pounds lost the next year and cash coming in and out and flying out yeah. uh, and that is a, you know th you know that was a that was a trading individual you know he's a very big character very very uh, enjoys risk loves living on the edge and uh, people sort of say you're never quite sure whether the business is going to be there tomorrow for example you know yeah. and that's reflected in in the, in the account so i i think you're absolutely right i mean this is you know one of the nicest cleanest set of accounts the strongest company you know it's it's a it's a great great business however we haven't talked about the elephant in the room moed yeah Go on. it's the valuation yeah okay so so my my understanding is that the latest investment that the 200 million i think it was dollars where i read but it may be pounds i think it was 200 million dollars made by uh what were they called um general uh athletic. general general athletic okay general athletic and, and this values the company at 1.45 billion yeah okay and that's my understanding 1.45 billion so just to put that into perspective that's 1,223 times earnings. Yeah. That's a, te that's We're a in Tesla. We're, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, you're, you're ahead of me there. We're in Tesla territory here. Yeah. Now, Tesla is not seeing 76% growth in sales. Okay. Yeah. So let's be absolutely clear that it's, it, you know, it's a different kettle of fish. They're selling cars. They've got to make the car. All this guy's got to do is to stitch together another T-shirt. OK, so expansion is much, much easier because he, he's not limited by production capacity. He can just, you know, find another factory in China and, and, and off he goes. So it's a volume game. Um, it's just that, that one thousand two hundred twenty three. That's that's the equivalent of investing your money in a bank bank account and getting 001 percent. You know, it's a very, very low yield. It says to us it's a very high price. So this is a great car. But this is a bit like looking at a car, a brand spanking new BMW, for example, and say, this is just a great car, the new M5. It's just, it's a fantastic car. And then being told the price tag is 750,000. And you're like, yeah, it's good. It's but good. <laughs> is it that good? Yeah, I'm just, you know, and I'm just thinking that, you know, if I was this investor and you're paying that much money, you know, there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good news in this. There's a lovely story, but it's all baked into the price. And, and this is the key thing: is that you know, there's two parts to you know, if you're making an investment, one of which is finding the gem, finding the you know, the, the jewel in the crown. But the other one is paying the right price. You know, and if you and if you pay too much for it, you may have a great company here, and it'll go on to do great things. And it looks like it is. But I don't think you're ever going to get back your investment. You're never going to, you know, really realize the value that you bought unless you can find a bigger mug than you. And believe me, there's a lot of bigger mugs than us um, out there. So sometimes, you know, you don't have to realize it by your investment. You just need to be able to flip it uh, and, and sell the story. Yeah. It kind of bring... Go on. Sorry, you were going to ask. No, no, ask I was just going to say, and maybe you were going to come on to it, actually, which was around, I mean... The... General Atlantic is owned by Chuck Feeney. And, and for, for those in the US, they'll know who Chuck Feeney is. I mean, he's the, he's the kind of duty-free king, right? And he's worth billions. So there's, there's, there's something in there that's making me thinking, what do they see that maybe we don't or others don't? Because there is that push for international because they're massive in the UK, slightly well-known in the US, but they're really making a push there and in Asia, as you saw in the Hong Kong. But the other thing is, Ted, the only moat that I really see that they have 
is that brand equity. But Absolutely. in an industry like this and the, mo and the people they're going after, it's quite fickle in my view. So I'm wondering what else, what other modes are, are there that we're not seeing or maybe that's just it? Well, I, and, 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 and let's just define that, that term moat, um, Moe, before we go any further. So, you know, if people are thinking about a moat, you know, there's no castle yeah, yeah. here. So we're talking about an economic moat that, that will allow them to defend the position they've got. So for Facebook, the economic moat is the network effect. I'm on Facebook because you're on Facebook and you're on Facebook because I'm on network, uh, Facebook. The same with Twitter uh, and with LinkedIn, for example. For Coca-Cola, the economic moat is the brand. There's thousands of cola brands out there, but there's only one Coca-Cola and they defend, they invest a lot of money. Uh, you know, so you could argue that something like uh, Canada Goose, for example, the economic moat is the brand. You know, I have a friend of mine, he's got a brand, he's selling Parkers for £1,400 a pop. And I'm just thinking, yeah, but unless you've got the brand on the, you know, nobody's going to be paying that, for example. So it's investing in the brand. And I, and, I, and I agree with you, you know, is the brand that strong? Now, I'm not part of the gym culture. I'm not part of these people who, who go along and stand in front of the mirror and, and kind of, you know, pull the weights and preen it kind of, you know, you know, my, my muscles aren't, aren't, you know, quite what they used to be. And I don't think they're going to get any better. So, um, you know, it, he, he's, he's promoted this on social media. You mentioned the Kardashians, for example. He's, he's done very well in getting influencers with lots of Instagram followers. And I'm not even on Instagram. So, you know, hey, what do I know? But, you know, he's found the social media influences. He's tapped into that vein. And, you know, it, and, and it's growing. Um, but I'm, I'm not convinced that, you know, it's, a, you know, as, as quickly as it grows, it could all become yesterday's news. It could all yeah. become, yeah, yeah, but that was that was Jim Shop. We're actually on to something else. So you might think of this in a Boston consulting group kind of matrix. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where we talk about cash yeah. cows, where you know he he's got a really good cash cow in Jim Shark. Has he got anything else in the pipeline? What's the next thing that's coming through Maybe that's going to kind of going to replace it? You know. Has he has he got something or is it a one trick pony? And, and, and maybe maybe it's not a one trick pony. You know, Coca-Cola has lots of different brands that it owns. But at the end of the day, Coca-Cola is Coca-Cola uh, as a one trick pony. It's done very well with that one trick. It, it's still a very much a, a, a cash cow. So maybe Gymshark is the thing to wear when you get out to the gym. Maybe that's what people are going to still be wearing and buying in their droves in 10, 20, 30 years time. But I, you know, fashions are, you know, I mean, you, you look at the death on the high street and the, kind of the brands which were up here yesterday and which have just completely fallen out of favor. It's a really fickle industry. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it needs a little bit more to justify that valuation. So don't get me wrong. Great company. Really, really good. But is it worth the one point four five billion that it's valued at? I kind of feel that it's possible that you know there are there are better investments out there now full disclosure but this uh, is our opinion right at the end of the day it is my opinion and yeah. when facebook floated i said don't buy the shares because they're too expensive uh, and that's why i'm still here because otherwise i'd have made my fortune by now and be retired on a super yacht somewhere maybe so you know don't follow my uh, don't follow my advice because i'm not qualified to give you my advice but um you know i am here to, to share an opinion and for me great company but i wouldn't be buying it at that price but it'd be interesting to see again general athletic they'll be looking to exit maybe to try and float and if they do float what price are they going to float out what's the multiple you know have they made money back on their investment we'll see yeah yeah really really interesting company to look at i'm actually glad that we talked about this one offline and decided to do this video because it's it's a Great example of a young entrepreneur, you know, succeeding in the dream that so many are, so many others are trying to do. Um, he's been very clever in terms of basically going after the thing that's going to make his business big, which is the brand. I mean, I think he understands it's a fickle industry and he needs to have that celebrity backing in order to endorse the brand and get people to buy it and love it. Plus, let's, let's, not, let's not take this away from him. It's a great product, actually. Um, it's, you know, he, he's tapped into a, a, a gap in the market. You know, there was nothing that was flattering 
you know, it apparently accentuates all the different parts of the body that young people in the gyms love to do. Uh, and I was young and I used to love doing it. So if I, if there was Gymshark was around during my day, I for sure probably would have bought it. Um, so, so it's a great business, but what I really, really like about this company is the character and the, of the business, you know, steady, not slow, but steady, clever, very meticulous and measured. And what I like about what the finances said when you describe the business is that he clearly knows where he's strong and he knows where he's not so strong. And he was clever enough not to let pride dictate what he should do. He hired the right people to do the things that he can't do very well, but he's retained that role as the president, but also the chief brand officer. So he, he knows what he's doing and what he's doing well. I think it's a great, great business, great story. Um, it, is, it is, Moeed. I, I, you know, and, and some people who are looking uh who are watching this video will be thinking you know what are the what are the little nuggets that i can do what can i do to kind of emulate that how can i be like him uh and i you know i will emphasize this do not underestimate the role of luck in what he's done yeah. um you know I, i'm not going to detract from anything he's done but there has been a substantial amount of luck that the, the fact that he managed to contact somebody, he got in with this person, he managed to get the right introduction, you know, he'd have been, he'd have worked very hard for it, but there's always a degree of luck and, and we can't all be lucky. No, but I've got to say, coming from a sales background, I, I, I personally say, I, I think there was a lot of tenacity and grit and hustle for him to get to that place where luck could come to him. So I think there's a Absolutely. huge amount of work that he did. You can create time. your luck. There is that luck that gets him over the edge, but if anyone's watching this, you better get yourself onto that square where luck will shine on, shine on you. Absolutely. Like there's no point. But I, I think great company for us to have looked at. And anyone selling to this business, we've just given you so much information there, especially about the character of the company, the way they use money, and what's going to be of value for them. So this was a great one. And you know, check out Ted's. Uh, Ted's website and what he's doing because uh, he's he's a bit of a wizard with this um, and uh, you know he can help you have a look at some of these finances and how to build up your business acumen so I think this is a great one and we've got another really exciting business to talk about next time which one are we talking about next well actually we're not talking about an exciting a business we're talking about a pretty boring business which isn't around anymore and we're going to look at Thomas Cook. Well, it's an uh, and, topic, uh, though, to see why it's not around. It, Sorry, that's what I meant. It is. <laughs> You're right. It's not that, it is. that exciting as a business, yeah. But we, we're going to be asking the question of, of should, you, should you check the financial accounts of your holiday provider before yes. you book that holiday um, so that you don't end up overseas uh, and, and stuck like about 150,000 people did when Thomas Cook went? And yeah. why did no one see it coming? And the answer is, Moeed, we did see it coming. You just got to know where to look. Absolutely. I, I cannot wait for that, for that video. So check it out, everyone. Subscribe to the channels if you want to get notification when that video comes out. But Ted, thank you so much. This was a great, great topic and a great business to look at. Until the next time.